Previously on Dry Powder, Karen Harris, the managing director of Bain's Macro Trends Group, explained how investors and policymakers were bracing for a global recession. Today on the show, we'll take a closer look at one macro variable that could transform the global economy, de-dollarization. I'll ask Karen whether the dollar status as the world's reserve currency is really under threat. In our view, globalization is fading into what we call a post-globalization world, then it logically follows that the financial system, this dollar system, would fade along with it. We'll also discuss how investors can position themselves for a more fractured global economy. I'm Hugh MacArthur, Chairman of Bain's Global Private Equity Practice, and this is Dry Powder. Now, Karen, I'd like to talk to you about de-dollarization. Could you teach us a little bit about what some of the factors are that could lead to the dollar losing its status as the global reserve currency? So I think we need to distinguish a reserve currency from the global dollar system. And those two are getting conflated in a lot of discussions that we're hearing. So if we look at recent events, we believe that we're seeing the sunset of the global dollar system. But also believe that the U.S. dollar will remain the most important reserve currency in the world. Those are not mutually exclusive or incompatible results. But if you think about what a globalized world looked like, the coin of the realm, so to speak, was the dollar sitting on top of a global dollar system. And that came about starting post-World War II when the U.S. was the only producer or one of the few left standing and intact and was exporting goods. And that reversed in the 70s through that next era for the U.S. to be importing goods and the source of capital. But it was still the U.S. dollar, the U.S. economy as a backstop to this system. And so in many respects, the U.S. dollar system is globalization viewed through the lens of currency. There are those who think that China might want to displace the dollar at the top of this global system, perhaps. But in our view, globalization is fading into what we call a post-globalization world. Then it logically follows that the financial system, this dollar system, would fade along with it. And that financial system looks more like an 1880 to 1914 multi-currency, multipolar, great power politics regime. So the transition affects all currencies. So the more certain implication of deglobalization is less movement of savings and capital across borders. And then geopolitics will outline the contours of trade versus the world we've come through where trade and finance define the contours of geopolitics. It's the inversion of that. But ending the global dollar system doesn't mean the U.S. dollar used outside its territorial borders will collapse. The U.S. dollar's incumbent position depends in many ways on it being a unit of account. It's a measurement like a meter or an inch. I do find it a little bit entertaining when there's a discussion about Bitcoin displacing the U.S. dollars. Well, it's priced in dollars. The anchor is the U.S. dollar. To be a reserve currency, you need to be tradable, movable, have value in an account. And I know that sounds a little bit arcane, but I do think it's important as we think about valuing the dollar, first, let's not panic that the dollar is going to be shunted to the side. When deals are being made in uh, Saudi Arabia to settle payments in Yuan with China, that's a sensible direction for both of those nations. And it will mean less trade being denominated in U.S. dollars. Of course, China-Russia trade was about 90% U.S. dollar denominated 10 years ago, and today they've effectively moved away in large part from the U.S. dollar, Uh, that demand for dollars may not be there. We may not have the dollar or the U.S. as the capital market for the world in a more broken system, but that doesn't mean that the dollar won't remain one of the most important reserve currencies. It sounds like it's almost natural evolution from the history lesson you just gave. I mean, the the U.S. GDP, I think, was nearly a quarter of global GDP at the end of World War II. It's obviously much less than that now as other economies have grown very rapidly over time. 
So in some ways, it's kind of natural that we wouldn't have a dollarized reserve currency for everything, that there would be other types of agreements as the world became more complex and other economies grew larger. So it made me wonder, is this really the kind of crisis that we see when we see the, the headlines in the media sometimes, or is this just something that is a natural evolution that we actually need to manage? And if you agree with me that perhaps it is, it was going to happen sometime sooner or later, and now maybe it's happening over the next decade or two decades or three decades or whatever that happens to be, how do you see the loss of the dollar as the global reserve currency affecting U.S. businesses and investors? So the retreat of the U.S. dollar is neither good nor bad. I think that's one of the overriding political questions for the United States, for Europe, uh, less for China, which I think has a clearer vision of where it wants to sit in a global system. It wants to be the power in Asia. And there's a question that the U.S. has geopolitically of how much it wants to challenge that position. Europe has in many respects, an even greater challenge because it has so many disparate interests. The European Union was able to think about its place in a globalized world, but now that there are geopolitical choices in different markets, we can see that tension. Emmanuel Macron wasn't wrong in characterizing that Europe needs to make a choice. His view, of course, is that it needs to be a third block in the world. But these are creating real localized tensions in geopolitics. And I think in our view, there's the most uncertainty around the path that the U.S. will take. Regardless of that, a multipolar world where trade happens in different currency units, that's neither good nor bad. It's value neutral. It's just a different era. But it's one where investors need to think about their international strategy, the markets they want to be in, because there'll be more friction between different markets than there was in a world, again, where trade and finance define geopolitics versus the inverse. So are you saying that we could be moving into a world where we have, for lack of a better phrase, multiple reserve currencies? Are we moving into an environment where we could have the dollar obviously continuing to remain relevant and strong? The RMB uh, obviously becoming very relevant in Asian markets, the euro uh, becoming relevant, maybe the pound sterling, but we may have four or five or a basket of currencies that all move in relation to each other in some way, shape or form. And that just is a more complicated world than a dollar denominated world, if you will. But it's one that investors and other people should be able to understand and manage. I think that's right. China will need to do some significant financial market reform for tradability if it wants the renminbi to not be a settlement currency, right, to settle in yuan and have the trade being done the way they are with Saudi Arabia is different than being a reserve currency or a store of value. So again, these are not fast trades. The last time the world had a system like this, Aside from the whole ending with World War I, which I'd like to think we can avoid, it was a period of massive, robust industrialization and innovation. And we had to do it all with carbon paper, right? There wasn't any digital tracking. You just wrote down a receipt and you hoped that when you wired it to New York, the funds would be available. It was a lot trickier. So this is a migration of a system, It's and but it's doesn't impact quality of life and trade. It's a different orientation. And I think that's why we look at post-globalization as almost like plate tectonics. You can see the direction that things are moving. It's negligible. Then there's a disruptive earthquake of a change. I think we'll look back at the Western response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, frankly, as one of those tectonic changes in that the weaponization of the dollar uh, or of Western currencies of holding reserves, which we'd flirted with with Iran, made countries that didn't want to have their policy dictated by the U.S. and Europe uncomfortable with keeping reserves and using their currencies in their trade. That was the start gun, but it's we're nowhere close to the dismantling of today's system. We're looking at 10, 20 years out. Even at 10 or 20 years out, investors need to prepare. And so let's talk a little bit about what quality of life will be for investors and avoiding some of those earthquakes that the plate tectonics of currency shift might pretend. One of the things that I could think of that would be a lot more complicated if I was an investor is that 
I may have my revenues in one currency and lots of costs in other currencies if I'm a global business. And if those things all move in different ways than I've anticipated, different ways than they've moved in the past, and we've always, to some extent, had global businesses that could have that type of architecture, but it could be a lot more volatile in terms of the value that, that currency changes might have on investments. What other types of risks or opportunities do you see for private equity investors in a world where the dollar is no longer the dominant currency? Well, and what goes behind the dollar no longer being the dominant currency is this post-global world where markets are far more susceptible to policy changes. We think about what happened with private education in China overnight that was erased. If you think about what U.S. CHIPS Act that put pressure on not just U.S. companies, but ASML in the Netherlands, Korean companies, those are really big changes. And I think having a robust sense of which industries are likely to be in those crosshairs, where are the geographies where if I want to invest in those industries, I'm comfortable that the geopolitics will be supportive of me as an investor, given where I'm located, my headquarters, who I am as a company, those are questions that really weren't on the table in almost any market 20 years ago. I think the good news is there are some markets that are clearly going to benefit from this. We're very optimistic about North America, reshoring supply chains, infrastructure. India is always tantalizing, but still hard to not be optimistic. And none of these are easy. We could spend six hours talking about all the things wrong with every market. In fact, that would be like a team meeting for the macro trends group. That said, investors are used to taking those risks. If it were easy, there wouldn't be returns since the the navigation of that. But the complexity doesn't mean that there aren't returns to be had in places like Brazil, India, the United States, where it's hard, frankly, not to be optimistic from an investor perspective. Well, Karen, as always, I feel like I've learned a tremendous amount, and we've been through a masterclass here that you've been teaching in the macro economy. I want to thank you. It's been a privilege to have you on the show today. Really appreciate you stopping by. I'm sure our listeners learned a tremendous amount, too, and I hope we can have you back next quarter with some fresh insights. Thank you, Hugh. Great to be here. I'm Hugh MacArthur. Thank you for listening.